This is Ultimate General Civil War. On Legendary Difficulty, this is the Battle of Chancellorsville and what a party this was. So one of the things you have to do before you go into Chancellorsville is you have to make sure that you can take 38 uh, reputation. So spend any reputation you need to uh, to get your reputation down uh, so that you can take 38 because between the two battles uh, that are going to happen, there's a follow-on battle after Chancellorsville. You want to make sure that you uh, don't lose any reputation by going over 100. So I have uh, my units have uh, 61s, uh, and then my units are about 1,700. The enemy is going to come in about 26, 2,700, but not 29. Um, I built a large army. As you can see, I have a lot of very good weapons. I, I've, I've grown to like the Texas. My green units have Lorenzes. Uh, they're only about 1,500. And I have a ton of auxiliary troops, uh, snipers and um, cav. I have a lot of cav. I built these six units of 10-pound parrots. Uh, a complete waste of time. I don't think they get a single kill. Uh, I have a nice inventory of weapons. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, my army's in really good shape. Really, really large numbers. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and the big thing is... What was that? 65,000 kills? So the enemy comes in with 85,000, kills 67,482. So just absolutely, absolutely huge, huge result. I was delighted with the number of kills, and I wanted to get them all. So the enemy is going to actually come in with 85,5. Um, I come in with 79,000. I'm surprised how many men I have in my army. Um, it says I'm going to come in with uh, 444 guns. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, that's a lot of guns. I have been buying all of the guns. So at the end of the battle, I get, uh, he comes in with one of his most exceptional commanders to train the enemy army. He goes up 20 in training, uh, to 93, 88 to 93, plus 20 points to training at the end of this battle. So we're going to, this is turned out to be a real interesting experiment. How high can the enemy drive up training? I should have, in the last battle, just taken the, uh, what was it, plus 13 to training? I mean, what the heck, man? If we're going to go to uh, 100 training, who cares? Let's, let's see how that affects the uh, performance of the enemy army. Needless to say, we're going to be looking at all three-star units. They're going to be attacking aggressively. Um, I think I lost a tiny bit of video there. So he's going to, he always tries to sneak something around your flank, if at all possible. We're going to put a stop to that. And um, normally he does not attack across the river that's uh, in the open, kind of on the Union left right now. He's going to aggressively attack everywhere. Hey, uh, legendary, everybody's three stars. Training of, what is it, 73 right now on its way to 93 at the end of this battle. So, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to face. Uh, he's going to attack everywhere. He's going to attack across the river here. He's going to attack, well, every place. And you know what? That's fine. In this phase, I think we get about 10 to 1. So I have a... Here's something that I've noticed. I have a lot of auxiliary troops. Uh, cav, both rifled and melee. Only two melee units, but a lot of rifled cav. And I'm buying really good rep weapons for my rifled cav and... Boy, are these getting good results. Um, all of the specialty weapons for your cab are really, really powerful. So, yeah, I'm really liking those. Melee, I'm still not getting great results. Yeah, they, they do a good job. Um, nice when you can gang up units on one of his isolated units, but very limited uh, what you can do with them. Um, yeah, this is great. I've got him in the water, and we're just going to, you know, bleed this guy to death. And that's what you have to do. You just have to be patient and take advantage of every opportunity you have on Legendary. So he's not attacking on my right, so I'm moving my uh, artillery around to where I know he's going to attack. And that turns out to be a good idea. This phase is going to go great. And then comes the second day. And here's the thing about the second day. Uh, you get third core. 
And when, when you think about Chancellorsville, here, here's the thing to really be aware of to have more fun in your game. Third Corps will come in on the second day and you get a chance to fight with them. And that's where a lot of your weakest units should be and they should do a lot of the fighting, which I do. I mean, I bring those guys in and they do a lot of the fighting. And, um, but then on the next day, the day after that, only four units from Third Corps come in. So basically you can move your units around or shuffle um, units, but those units aren't gonna show up again. So basically, you have a one-day opportunity to get as much fighting as possible. And since those are my weakest units, my greenest units, I have a couple no-star units there. I really wanted those guys to get into it and get fighting. And when I saw the enemy had so many men, the, the enemy army was so large. And when I came in here and saw how large the enemy units were, this means that you have to have your units firing on his units all the time. You just can't sit back and wait. You have to be degrading the enemy all the time in order to kill them all. Uh, my goal in this battle wasn't to win this battle. It was to annihilate the enemy and rack up the kills as high as possible in the hope of driving down training. You know, that worked out perfectly, as you can see. So he only went up 20 points in training instead of, you know, well, you know, it's a joke. I mean, it, the point was to drive down his manpower pool and training and armory and yeah that didn't happen so we did drive down the manpower pool though so or did we did we drive down the manpower pool i have to look i forgot because i'm so focused on plus 20 training no manpower pool went up one so yeah so yeah but may, maybe manpower would have gone up a lot more if i hadn't killed sixty-seven thousand five hundred. so Anyway, my point is, on day two, I wanted to get in and engage the enemy. I wanted to degrade his army as much as I could, and I wanted to get third corps more experience, but I didn't want first and second corps to sit out. I wanted them to get kills, too. And it, it worked, but there was a price. And it, it was a decision I made that I was going to accept greater casualties by attacking out of good cover. So I get about 10 to 1 here. I get about 10 to 1, I think, on day 3. But on day 2, um, I take two to 3,000, roughly, casualties that I didn't need to take. So was it worth it? Could I have been a little... I think I could have been less aggressive and kept my losses down, but I went after him. And... Ray Rivers did a great job of going after the enemy on day two and um, wiping out a section of his army. I think I attacked in too many directions. I think on day two, and, and that makes, you know, that, that makes it a micromanagement nightmare as well because you have too much going on in too many places. And um, if, I, if next time I'm not going to attack in so many places, basically it was... Um, hold at the victory location, but everybody else everywhere attacks. And I think next time I'm going to attack less aggressively, stay in cover, not come out of cover quite so much, don't go after him like I'm trying to... I mean, I was trying to wipe him out, and I, I didn't make it. So it wasn't worth the cost, because the payoff is you wipe them out. Uh, you weaken them, and then you, you know, you kind of harvest a bunch of free kills. So... Yeah, that, that didn't work out. Um, so I took those losses and did not get an annihilation, just inflicted casualties. I don't think it was... I mean, it was okay. It made day three easy. And you're going to see, day three is easy. But it made day two costlier than it needed to be. So I, I could have driven down my casualties probably 2,000 easily, and I think gotten the same result. My concern when doing this, and I've been thinking about it for a couple of days now, is if I hadn't, if I wasn't as aggressive as I was on day two, maybe day three is a much harder fight, uh, and that changes the outcome somehow. I don't think so. As you're going to see, day three is really crushing, and then day four is just a mop up of you know the remnants of his army that come in on the very last day, and it's you know there's nothing there, so. 
Yeah, as you watch this, I, there are two things. I think I was overly aggressive. I, I think going after the enemy was good, but overly aggressive attacked in too many places, so the battle gets difficult to control, and then you have a micromanagement nightmare. And also, the more auxiliary troops you have, the more difficult it is, and the more you have to micro, and I have a ton of auxiliary troops, which means a ton of micromanagement. Um, snipers, um, the cav, the ca as you'll see, the, the cav is a micromanagement nightmare on day two. Um, have to hit pause a lot to get those guys under control. And, I mean, they're very, very good, and they're very powerful, and they do great work, but they require constant individual management of individual units. And so I think that what you want to do is you want to focus on doing... Um, like a lot of your line is just stable, not doing very much, just defending, and then you're you're focused on attacking in one place. And as you're going to see, I'm attacking in a bunch of places and, and just have too much going on. So uh, the more you can minimize that, I think the, the better. So I'm kind of getting a feel for if you're going to have a lot of cav and snipers, you want most of your army to be stable, in cover, just blasting away at the enemy, not requiring a lot of your attention, and then all of your cav and all of your snipers and your best artillery is doing, is attacking somewhere, or doing something that requires 90% of your focus, and you're able to give it that focus. So, yeah, and um, I've never had this much cav before, and it really changes how I'm thinking about fighting these battles. Um, before... I would maybe attack in two different places or attack both the enemy left flank and right flank simultaneously. And I'm starting to think in terms of uh, battlefield management. How much attention do I have? How many times do I want to hit the pause button? And the answer is, you know, nobody wants to hit the pause button. You, you just want to play. So to minimize that, especially if you have a bunch of auxiliary troops, you just can't be doing a lot of things. You have to be focused on one area. So, yeah, and using the strategic map. Like, I watch that strategic map a lot. And the more you get used to looking at the strategic map and, and using it like a rearview mirror in your car, glancing at it and keeping an eye on red dots, um, the easier it is to micromanage your battle. You have to pay attention to everything that's going on everywhere and be aware when... Uh, new dots appear on the strategic map like they just did. Uh, blue dots just appeared in the uh, upper corner of the map, and my reinforcements just came in. So, yeah, you just have to be aware of where things are all the time. And if you are, you're not going to be caught by surprise. So, yeah, the other thing is uh, spotting is I'm noticing that's becoming really, really, really important. It's difficult to see the enemy. Um, and that is important because I have built a huge um, army of um, artillery, 20-pound parrots, and I need to be able to see enemy artillery to kill it. And right now I don't see a single battery, not a single gun. So, yeah, I have actually the burn sides here. Because the burn sides have great spotting ability, I'm kind of giving everybody spotting spotting ability because seeing the enemy is crucially important. And I have all these weapons to kill him, but if I can't see him, it doesn't matter. So yeah, my cav is here to give me visibility, but right now I'm afraid to use the cav because he's fragile, and if he gets hit, he's out of the he's out of the battle. Um, I don't intend to replace any men during the battle um, because that screws up what you get back in medicine and I have so many units that if a unit takes a hit he just goes to fifth core and will sit out the rest of the battle so um, yeah that's my that's my strategy for that I'm not going to replace any men so basically what that means is if my cav takes a hit it's only 360 uh, he takes a hit or two I, he's basically out of the battle I won't be able to use him from that point on so I'm, I've gotten into the habit of having my rifle cav sit behind the lines and do things 
during the aggressive part of every phase and then kind of use them more in the counterattack phase when, when they really shine. So if I bring them out too soon, they just take a bunch of losses. So anyway, that's, that's pretty much the story here. I'm catching the enemy in the water. He's cooperating nicely. Usually he attacks more to the left in, that, in the trees. I'm delighted that he's attacking where he is. I don't have a lot of infantry over there. And he could just pop right through those few units. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm moving some reinforcements over. And yeah, it turns out I have stacked my army to kind of the center of my line where all my best troops are and he never really does very much there it's all along this river line that he's really pushing hard so yeah I need my reinforcements to get in that's never happened before where I really needed those reinforcements to get get online to hold the line so yeah I guess the the big deal here is if I take a look at the size of my units they all came in at 17 and already some of them are down to like one unit I that's been in contact with the enemy is down already to 1100 he probably has a detached skirmisher of 200 so he's down to 13 or 1400 I like the size of these units even though it drove up scaling um, I don't mind that these units are quite so large it just means a longer fight it's going to take longer to annihilate him but I'm really happy with the number of kills I'm just absolutely delighted with it I've become kind of fixated on just getting huge kills in these battles and um, yeah notice the CS Richmond unit is standing in the open everybody else is, has nice cover he doesn't um, I, I'm using him to plug the line, and he's doing really good damage to the enemy. He's getting 4 to 1 where he is. So, yeah, I keep thinking he's going to make that guy route, but, you know, when training is this high, these guys aren't going to route. In fact, they're going to charge. They're going to take losses and charge. So, what I'm looking at now is a unit of, um, it's a little blurry, but it looks like it's 2,600 maybe, and I have a unit of 1,100 and just some very weak detached skirmishers, so I would send my burn side over there. Those burn sides, dismounted, do an amazing job. Just amazing. They fire volley after volley into the enemy, and unlike the 59s, uh, each shot does a lot of damage, and it seems to really affect the enemy morale. Yep, finally the the unit the CS Richmond was firing into finally um, fell back. And now he can just get shots on somebody in the water and do even more damage. Yeah, I have my commander up close to give a cover bonus to everybody. I love that cover bonus. And um, yeah, the I had uh, my reinforcements run, so they're a little tired. But they got there. And now the, the Union left is stable. Not just stable, but we're pushing him back into the water and we're going to inflict, inflict a lot of casualties. Yeah, when I check the... Um, I probably edited it out, but I checked the losses. I was really shocked how many kills uh, my units got here and uh, how few my losses were. But if you catch the enemy in water and you just keep firing into them, you're going to do very well. I'm trying to kill his corps commander. I don't think I get him, but I think he has four corps commanders. And if you can get them, if you can kill those four core commanders, that really makes the battle a lot easier. Because uh, on Legendary, he has a recovery time of about two seconds. So that, that seems to go a whole lot better if you can manage to kill his leaders, and then it takes him a bit longer to recover.
So I'm shifting my artillery to where most of the fighting is happening. I've never had to do that before. But if he's going to keep attacking into that water, I want to harvest those kills. My 24 pounders are not getting a lot of... Well, I mean, they're getting a lot of kills. Yes, but they could get a lot more kills if they were closer to where the enemy's crossing the water. They would um, do two and a half times damage, so they would get two and a half times kills. And also, my 24-pound howitzers are not in canister range of anything um, in the center or on the right. So, but on my the Union left, they would be in canister range. So, yeah, I should have moved those sooner. But I thought he was going to... I kept thinking he was going to attack in the center. And he just didn't get around to it. Well, he does eventually loss, launch some kind of an attack in the center, but... I mean, with that... With, there are four artillery pieces there that are all very good. And... Yeah, my best infantry is just waiting in the woods to chop him to pieces, so that's just not going to go well for him. So I'm backing my guys off on the left because I want him to charge into the water again. Uh, I'm not done here, man. I'm, I'm ready to fight. And this phase is coming to an end, and that's just nothing but too bad because this was a party. Okay, proceeding to the next day, and we lost no officers. Amazing. I think I lose one or two officers in the entire battle, which is really a shock. And thanks to Pandakraut for um, drawing my attention to how useful it is to move units around. And what I'm doing is I'm shuffling units around so that my best units are in the first three divisions and my weaker units are in uh, fourth division. You can actually move them between units between divisions. And I think I actually take two units that have taken a lot of losses and just pump them into 5th Corps. Um, I'm checking to see how many men I lost, and to my surprise, I didn't lose any. I don't think I lost any men in my artillery units. Did I lose any at all? And no, I lost no men, but that's actually bad. That means my 24-pound howitzers, I, I know they got a lot of kills, but they could have gotten more kills. If they didn't lose any men, they were not close enough to the fighting. So, yeah, it, it's, um, I'm looking at that and I'm going, oh, I've got to get them closer to the front. But ironically, in the next phase, the 24, my best 24-pound howitzers don't do anything. Um, they sit out all the fighting. They're nowhere near where the best fighting is. So, yeah, at this point, it's going to be day two. I, I outnumber the enemy, but a big part of my army just has to sit on kind of guard duty. And unfortunately, it's some of my best units. And around the victory location where nothing happens, I will have my best artillery, my best long-range guns. And uh, that's a big heads up for me. Don't do that next time. I keep thinking he's going to attack over there with something, even though it never happened on any other level of difficulty. He never attacked and uh, at that location. But um, yeah, that I should have moved my best guns down to this part of the battlefield. Now watch this. This is really great. He has a three-star cav unit that is almost a thousand. And I've intentionally uh, uh, brought everybody over here and we're going to charge this guy. He's an isolated unit. He's all alone. He gets hit by a bunch of units uh, from, all, from a couple different sides, really. And he surrenders. Uh, say goodbye to a thousand unit cav unit three stars and it was because if you can if he had had a, another unit of cav here he wouldn't have surrendered but he was all alone isolated and i got the uh, two to one melee bonus and yeah it worked out perfectly so what i'm going to do is all the units that are in the wrong place which is just about everyone but all the units that are on the union far left, because you have to face south, uh, they're in the uh, north-right corner of the map, they need to move and be 
the union right. So they need to go from being the union left to the far union right. And there's uh, along the north edge of the map. And the question is how to get them there. Uh, I'm taking first division of first corps, my best units, and I'm moving them to, uh, they're going to be just south of that. So the enemy is going to attack down that long road that you see runs left to right across the map right there. So he's going to attack exactly how my units are moving right now. And what I want is I want first division to be about the observation post. That's their, you know, I need to stage them there and, and move them forward based on what the enemy is going to do. Uh, second Corps is going to have probably two divisions, and they're going to be um, to the right of that, north of that. And their job is to eventually push across the river and occupy that clump of woods north of the river uh, that is the far Confederate left. So, yeah, you can see them. I'm sending them down this road, and then they're going to deploy in those woods, and, and hopefully the enemy attacks into the water. We hammer them and then launch our counterattack from there. So, yeah, first division, hold the woods south of that, and then... It's, uh, this is all third core. So third core, you can see that they're all of these units where the cab is moving right now from that little clump of woods that is highlighted right now, the woods to the left, the woods that are to the south where I'm moving right now. That's all kind of, um, I think that's all, yeah, that's all, no, I have some, yeah, that's all third core. And this is third core's opportunity to fight. And I really, really want to get these guys some XP. I have a bunch of one-star artillery units, 10-pound um, ordnance units, and I, I want all these guys to get a bunch of kills. And this is a huge opportunity. There's a whole lot of killing opportunity here, and I want these guys to get these kills. So the CAV is basically a screening force right now that as soon as everybody gets in place, uh, I have plans for my CAV, and it's not this. So... Uh, they need to be on the enemy flank and looking for, um, but not in the middle of the fighting. Cavs should never be in the middle of the fighting. So I have snipers up and, yeah, again, snipers, cav, micromanagement. So, yeah, here come second, here's second core coming in on the far right. They're going to be a little bit tired, but they'll be okay. You know, I know they'll be okay. They'll be able to fight. And we just need to buy some time for them to recover. And then eventually, when the enemy's weakened, counterattack. And, you know, as usual, if I can catch the enemy in the water, that would be, you know, that'd be the ideal. I want them to advance into the water. Right now, I'm exchanging shots across water with his overpowered skirmishers. And that's not good. So the units that have six on them, those are six-pound rifles. Uh, they can shoot at any distance. They do about the damage of 10-pound parrots or 10-pound ord in a in any battle. Uh, but what they're really good at, is, and you'll see them do it, is when enemy artillery shows up, uh, they can shift to being an anti-artillery, a counter-battery gun, and do great work at long range. So, yeah, this is... You know, this, these guys are really, really useful and really flexible. So, yeah, that's great. His cab is going to charge uphill and get hammered. Yeah, I've got him down to 800, and we'll just keep chipping away at him. Hopefully he keeps doing that. So yeah, the army's getting into place. I'm moving some 24-pound howitzers to my right. Because I really hope he attacks really hard in that area. We've occupied the wood, the wood line to the south. And yeah, we're pretty much all set up, ready for him to attack.
Yeah, exchanging shots with enemy across water is uh, not a good plan. So it's great that my detached skirmishers are giving me visibility of his snipers so that they can, so my artillery can hit him, so that's good. But um, we're not winning that exchange. So you'll notice I moved my cav already to the far north. You know, this is about getting spotting. Um, it's not about them going out and taking shots on artillery, although they are going to do that. It's about getting visibility of what's out there and getting visibility of what's behind the enemy line. So, yeah, I have all these long-range guns, and I need to get some visibility of where they are so I can kill them. Because one of my goals in this phase is to kill as much of his artillery as possible. So, yeah, I had my detached skirmishers fall back. And he stepped into the water just like I wanted him to. That's great. So you'll see that uh, the line is being extended to the right. Uh, units are coming online. At this point, there's no possibility that he's going to break this line and, and break through. More units are coming up, and now it's just a question of trying to catch him in the, you know, in the open while my guys are in good cover and doing as much damage as we possibly can. The little forward clump of woods right there that, that you just saw, I don't really care if we hold that or not. We can fall back to the next clump of woods. That's, that's perfectly fine. That there's no chance he... I, I don't think there's any way he pushes me back from that second clump of woods to the right. Um, and it turns out, I don't think he can push me back from this little clump of woods. It's forward. I thought he'd be able to push me out of there, but I don't think so. Um, yeah, I really hope he attacks. He does not attack as aggressively as I really hoped he would um, to that, that southern clump of trees. I have these units and lots of artillery in there. He does attack, but I was hoping he'd attack a lot more because that's suicide. Uh, the more he attacks there, the more he's just going to die. Yeah, his detached skirmishers, I lose visibility on those guys. That's irritating. So his cav, it's probably the same unit that was at one time 900 to 1,000. And he's going to take some shots. Hopefully we'll get him down under 500. Yeah, my you can see my center left is doing nothing. He's going to have some... Snipers step up and, you know, basically do nothing. And it's not worth the attention of all those good units and all that, the good artillery. My good artillery needed to be over here. So that's something. Oh, yeah, that's the first unit that comes out as a supply wagon. I am a, absolutely a big believer that the Union needs to get foreign logistics for the Union campaign. The... Uh, once you get four logistics, which which I got very early in this campaign, once you get four logistics, your ammo problems basically disappear. So if you'll remember, I made it through Shiloh without running out of ammo. I didn't manage to empty the supply wagons, uh, and that was because uh, Shiloh is a really tough battle to not run out of supply. And... Uh, I was able to do it because my two commanders had the supply buff. One brigadier general that I used just for Shiloh uh, gave him a supply perk and had four in logistics, and that made all the difference. And um, every one of these battles, having four in logistics is just uh, just makes these battles so much easier. So... I'm pushing up training, but up until this point, I've I've spent almost nothing on veterans. Uh, I've spent almost everything on good guns, and starting to get really big payoff for having all of these good guns. And um, man, I have a lot of twenty-pound parrots right now, really in good shape already for um, for the the end campaign. And I'm thinking specifically about Mule Shoe. I mean, I have an artillery army right now that's ready for, for
for Mule Shoe. And um, yeah, I have one division of um, 12 uh, 10 pound parrots, uh, 12 guns each battery, and I have six batteries, 72 um, 10 pound parrots. And uh, in this battle, and they, yeah, they don't do anything, but they're there. Uh, it would have been nice if they, if I'd been able to unload them on the enemy, but they come in on the far left, and there's nothing happening on the far left. So, um, I put them in fourth core, and that was, uh, they were not useful in fourth core. They would have been more useful, maybe, I don't know, third core. They'd have been more useful in first core. I, I don't know. Uh, I should have. Um, you know, it's one of the things, next time I play, I'm going to bring in a bunch of artillery. Uh, first of all, I'm going to bring them in so they can come in to this part of the battle, and secondly, I'm not going to just let them sit around the victory location and do nothing. So, yeah, I could have done better with the placement of my artillery and the scheduling of how I would bring artillery in. And if you're going to play this uh, on Legendary, you have to know where they bring your units in and when. There's just no way around that. So. Yeah, there I am micromanaging, micromanaging my cav and micromanaging my six pound rifles to shoot at his artillery. Two examples of micromanagement. So I thought I told everybody to charge and I think they finally did and killed his cav. Got the three to one buff. For some reason they fired first, backed off, fired, and then I guess they charged? I don't know. Uh, it looked weird, but it worked out. So, yeah, I captured his supply wagon. He has two wagons that he, like, tries to send to his attack from the far, from the other side of the map through your army, and you can pick those guys up. So I'm just trying to get visibility right now. I can see one of his artillery units. Uh, my long-range guns are shooting at him. Uh, keep in mind, I have 20-pound parrots and Whitworths that could be firing at this guy if they were over here, uh, but they're not. So, yeah, I have 6-pound uh, rifles. 6-pound rifled guns firing at that artillery battery instead of Whitworths, and at some point it occurs to me, why don't I bring my Whitworths over here? And... So I have them move, and also just moving to the other side of the map is good because it builds up stamina. Yeah, um, so what happens with my Whitworths is I bring them into a grand battle, they get a bunch of kills, and then because that unit just became a one-star or even two-star unit because of all the kills the Whitworth got, I put 20-pound parrots in there and the Whitworths get pushed down to a, a weaker unit. So the Whitworths never get to shine because every time a unit gets strong, um, the Whitworths get replaced by 20-pound uh, parrots. So the Whitworth is great at uh, driving up the kills, getting kills on enemy artillery, uh, driving up the efficiency of units, but the Whitworths never stay in those units. So, um... Yeah, but even with that, and I've run experiments with the Whitworth, they just never get the kills of the 20-pound parrot, even if you put them in three-star units versus 20-pound parrots in three-star star units. It's... they're not as good. So, again, I would consider them more of an auxiliary unit that you have to micromanage, because if they're not focused on taking out enemy artillery at long range... Um, and the only way you do that is you, you have to keep targeting enemy units. So here I get free shots on enemy artillery. But what I really wanted these guys to do is get visibility on this artillery to the rear so that my artillery could hit him. But it's occurred to me as I'm doing this that my Whitworths and 20-pound parrots are in the wrong place. And I really needed the Whitworths over here to do this. So... So everything's going well. My um, attack to the north is coming down into the woods. Um, I'm just 
letting these guys get into melee right now. Uh, it's a one star 55 uh, with 55s, and we just pop that guy, that three star unit. Um, the guy behind him is in the water. We're going to pound him too. Uh, he's he's on the retreat. We've we've got him, and these are all uh, third core units that need XP. The guys with Lorenzes are no star units, and they're just they're getting good kills. Doesn't really matter how many men they lose. What matters is how many kills they get. I'm sending forward detached skirmishers to get visibility so my artillery can keep firing at something. And I'm seriously considering at this point how weak he is and how. Notice how I'm wrapped all the way around his army. Um. And I'm looking at units that are not fighting. Like, my army's in great position. But too many units are not fighting. And these guys that have marched all the way around the enemy flank are have good condition. And there's no reason not to go after the enemy. And I see two of his guns pretty much undefended. Yeah, it's just... And here he has a unit that's in the water. Yeah, this this is all just too tempting. This is where I decide to go after him just completely go after him. I'm not going to sit back and um, do nothing. We're going to go after this guy. Uh, we're going to kill, like, I'm looking at three of his artillery units. His one unit is down to 161. He's going to die. I see two more units that I need to get closer to him. I have a whole bunch of infantry that can run up and kill those two. I have Cav behind him. Um, there's no reason... Oh, I think, is that my Whitworth? I think I finally brought him up. So my Whitworth is getting shots. My six-pound rifles are getting shots on his artillery. My cab is going to get shots on whatever the heck they want to get shots on and be a general nuisance. The Maynards are having a good day. They're doing okay. So, yeah, and this is where I start attacking in way too many directions. So there's an attack in the north, there's an attack in the center, there's an attack in the south, and I'm just going to keep going. I'm looking at the clock, and it's uh, 2030. So... I'm aware that he can retreat all the way to the edge of the map, and for my army to go from where it is to the edge of the map is going to exhaust every unit here and be very costly, because my units are now in the open. So the first thing I have to do is get my artillery up in support. It's too far away. Yeah, here I have units in the open firing on him in the open, just so I can get shots on his artillery. Probably not worth it. Even though he's collapsing... See, I'm just taking more losses. And, um... Even though these are... Not my best units. Yeah, the Iron Brigade is going to have such a good day. Um, he hasn't done a whole lot yet, but he's just going to get a whole bunch of kills. Um, even though, yeah, day one, he pretty much sat out the battle, and day two, he hasn't done anything yet. Um, remember, first, first Division of First Corps has joined the battle. Um, yeah, he had a unit in the south, that crossed, I think I edited that out, he he crossed the river and I had a bunch of units over there and they just hit him and he routed and now I'm just going to chase after him. And there's an example of another just distraction. There's too much going on to micromanage everything, there are too many units that need micromanagement. Uh, that crossing the river should not have done it. Uh, not because we couldn't inflict casualties on the enemy, we did. but. It, it makes it more difficult to micromanage everything else. And in the south, where we're looking right now, I'm actually going to cross the river. That's going to be an area that needs micromanagement. In the center, needs micromanagement. And in the north, needs micromanagement. So, too many things going on. I'm excited about going after him in all those places, but it would have been better if I'd concentrated in one of those places at a time. And the reason I didn't do that is because it's almost 2100 on the clock, and the phase is, you know, the day is almost over, and I want to inflict as many casualties as I possibly can 
and particularly for third core, get as many kills as I possibly can. And um, because these guys, this is their only chance. So if they take 2,000 casualties, but they get 5,000, that's actually good for them because uh, they're all one star and no star units. So yeah, but overall, as I think about it, you know, as I thought about it, is it worth it? Yeah, I'm still torn. I'm still torn. Well, um, you be the judge. See how day three turns out, because the whole point of this is to see, you know, to set up day three to be as, as deadly as possible. And day three is deadly. So... It's very late in the day, and I have three more cav units coming in, and yeah, and the question is, where should I send those guys? Where should I send those three cav units? Okay, the big thing that I'm that I thought right here is my units are in the open. He actually has units in the woods. And my artillery is nowhere near where they need to be. So, yeah, that's bad. My units are taking hits. His unit can sit in the woods all day and be perfectly fine. Um, my artillery is rolling up, but until my artillery gets there and does its work, that guy's going to sit in the woods and just inflict casualties on my army. Even though I'm, I have one, two, three, four, five units around him firing into him, he can sit there all day. Well, he can sit there for a very long time and do a lot of damage. So I've caught some of his units in the water um, to the south. That's good. The I keep editing out what happened uh, across the river to the right and because it's not much happens and there's only one unit there and it's just a distraction. I should have, you know, just not worried about it. Also going south, I know he has an art artillery battery or two or three, not just here, but even further south, and the opportunity to kill some of his artillery is just too tempting. But it's not worth it. Is what's happening now is I'm rushing because it's so late in the day. 2118, it's getting very, very late, and yeah, but... but what happens in Ultimate General Civil War to everybody is you kind of get in this attack mode where I'm going to go get him kind of mode. And once that you get in that mode, um, it's really hard to back off. You just want to attack. I mean, you just want to go get him. And yeah, this sucks. I tell these three units, two of them are melee cav to charge, and then the unit goes invisible. But, does, but your charge meter doesn't reset. So... That sucks, because when he pops back into visibility in a second, I can't charge him. Um, yeah, it should be. When you hit charge, the unit can't go out of visibility, because you were, charged, you were close enough to charge at him. Um, the unit should keep charging in that direction and hit him. But, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, my units are going to be right next to him and not able to charge, so I'm just going to have to move into melee which is not as good as charging. You don't get a charge bonus. And keep in mind, my commander is a, for, I think, yeah, for fourth core, is a cav uh, commander. So my cav units are going to get huge charge bonuses. But, yeah, I can get into melee, but I can't charge. Yeah, I really hate these detached skirmishers. So one of them surrenders. Um, he's trolling me with that supply wagon. I don't think I ever get him. I don't. <clears throat> I don't believe I get that supply wagon. He's just right there, but he has so many infantry units around it.
Yeah, his units are completely um, broken at this point, and I need to. I just want them to get out of the woods, so his units are isolated. I'm going to have two infantry units charge each one of his and break them, and this is a perfect example of how that happens. Um, his unit starts at almost 1,700. My units are going to get him into melee and get that bonus. Even though he's in the woods, we should get a huge huge bonus. Uh, what screws can screw this up is if um, the enemy units um, kind of get close to each other and then he gets a melee bonus because there are two of his units. So I don't want that to happen. So he loses a couple hundred. He would have lost more if he'd been in the open, but he's now routing and getting out of there. So yeah, I want to push him completely out of the woods, but again, it's closing in on 2200. It's unfortunate that I'm not going to be able to uh, wipe these guys out, but they're going to be saved by the bell again. So you be the judge. Um, was it worth the attack in the north to take the extra casualties, even considering it was third corps? I think it was an extra 2,000 casualties. It certainly makes day three really easy. Um, the next phase is going to be very easy. Um, I don't think I should have attacked to the south. I attacked to the south both east and west. That's too much. It's just uh, too much going on. Too many hitting of you know too many times hitting the pause button. Just uh, cuts into the fun factor. Yeah, basically I'm closing in on 2200. My artillery can't keep up. And... Yeah, my units are getting shots. They're definitely getting kills, but they're also taking losses. Oh, I do get the cav... I do get the supply wagon. Right right at the end, my... Uh, my cav unit is going to snag that supply wagon. So that's cool. And actually, I think I actually get the second supply wagon. So yeah, looking on the strategic map, there's, um, there's way too much going on. And all that doesn't need to be going on. So this is in the far south uh, of the map, and although we're really hammering the enemy, we took a lot of losses uh, getting there, and I don't have the time to wipe those units out. On the plus side, we are killing a lot of artillery, and that was one of the things I wanted to do. So yeah, it's, as I watch this, I'm constantly reevaluating if it was worth it. And um, yeah, maybe it was. Maybe it was. Took out a lot of artillery at the cost of a couple thousand losses, yeah, and now we outnumber him two to one, and one officer lost, one officer, I, yeah, one officer, all of that fighting in the open, all those losses, one officer lost, so I have nothing to support this, and it should not be a mechanic, I mean, it would make sense if it were a mechanic, but it's not, I still think keeping divisions together, um, I see fewer losses, and I know that's not the mechanic, it's percentage of losses to unit size, but uh, one officer lost, even though my units were in the open, taking losses from units on legendary. One. So that's something. Okay, I have fought this battle many times and tried many different strategies. I think I have broken the code on day two, or now day three. I think I've broken the code on day three. This is a unique um, position that I'm going to create that I haven't seen anyone else do. And uh, I've seen variations of it, but nothing quite like it. So I hope you like this and enjoy it.
uh, it's really effective. And it might be it's effective because the enemy's cut down to, what, 35,000? Uh, but it might just be really good. So what I want to do is I want to give the enemy every opportunity to step into canister fire. And I have, as you know, 440 guns. And uh, I want all 444 guns to unleash on this guy. And yeah, it, it's... Now, we don't start the battle with all of our guns. I mean, we have, di we have divisions, entire divisions... Well, one entire division of artillery coming in. I think that division comes in at the end of this battle, toward the end. But uh, we have more coming in than we currently have. But we have a lot of artillery here. And it's going to do really well. So notice how slow my one-star unit is moving. It's tired. I have these three one-star units that are fairly tired, and they're taking artillery fire. One of them is taking artillery. They're just tired units, and so they're moving painfully slow. And I need to get them back to the line. One of them is going to have zero condition when he gets there, so I just have him walk far to the rear of the army and sit out for half an hour and get his condition back. Units without condition cannot fight. They're just going to stand and die. So what I want to do is get my units with condition into a position to fight, get my tired units to the rear to rest. This is going to be a long day, and we have plenty of time to rotate units in and out of the fighting. Uh, get my artillery into the right place. I want to give the enemy an, art an opportunity to step into the open and take canister to the face. Uh, I don't care that much if my units are um, in the open. I want them to get 50% cover or better, if possible, but if they don't, that's okay. The important thing is that behind the infantry will be uh, enormous numbers of guns. That's entirely the plan. And the enemy is going to step forward and die. So you'll notice my line... Uh, in the north is in the woods in good cover with artillery, and he usually attacks there, and I hope that he does. Um, and then around the victory location, I want the victory location to tempt him forward. I should really back up behind the victory location, I just need room for all my artillery batteries, basically. And, uh, yeah, everybody should, you know, I'd like to back people off more, but I don't want my infantry all crowded up so much they can't maneuver. And then to the, the Union left is occupying the woods, but giving the enemy every opportunity to step forward into that open road. And on the far Union left, I have snipers and cav. And this works out great. I can't recommend this enough. They're just sitting there. Some infantry, some snipers, and some cav. And these guys are going to be absolutely crushing for the enemy. Um... I, I have them in reserve. I don't need them right now, so they're just waiting for the opportunity when I turn them loose. I want to give the enemy every opportunity to move his infantry forward and away from his flanks. Um, and then when there's nothing on his flanks, I'm going to attack both of his flanks, actually. And But the attack on the left is going to be mostly cav, because I, know, I want to get behind his line, attack his infantry and his artillery that's uh, behind his line. The infantry that's going to go is basically there to, was, I had intended them just to support and protect the cav and the snipers. So I didn't want snipers and cav alone. Now there are a lot of people who do that, that just go behind enemy lines with snipers. I don't like that. If you get caught, your snipers die. Your snipers can't move as fast as his, his infantry. His three-star infantry on legendary is, you know, they're... They, they're on roller skates, man. You cannot move that fast. So if he catches you, if he sees you, he can run you down and kill you easily. And um, so I'm not going to risk that. I have these good units with JF Browns, and I'm not just I'm not going to risk them. 
So other people do, I'm not. And so there's going to be infantry to provide protection for these guys so that if they get spotted, they can run away. But I'm going to patiently wait until um, the moment is... Uh, I think the moment is right, and we have plenty of time now. It's only 6 a.m., we have plenty of time, and the moment's going to be right when all of his, the enemy is committed to attacking. And then we're going to be able to get behind his lines and uh, around his flanks, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be absolutely devastating. Um, this is a 10 to 1 day, I'm pretty sure. So one of the things I wanted to do was, because I knew that my units would be in the open on this day, I I wanted to do as much damage as I possibly could to his artillery on the second day. And we were able to do that. And in fact, his units are now pretty small, and you just saw one of his units shatter. And um, yeah, he's still going to attack, and now I have three units firing into one of his. Um, but it really, it's the artillery. I mean, 20-pound Parrot firing at this guy with uh, hitting him. 24-pound uh, Howitzer. I mean, it's just a lot of artillery. Yeah, his unit started at uh, 26, 2700, 25, 26, 27, something like that, and we're looking at units that are now down under 1,000. Okay, the enemy has committed himself to his attack, and so I am now going to get um, my cav units. And again, it's mostly about spotting, not about getting the cav into fighting, Although I'd like to get them to get some kills, which they're going to do. They're going to get plenty of kills. But spotting is more important than killing. Um, that Lorenz unit uh, would have come in at 1,500, so he's lost 500. And yeah, if a green unit gets one-to-one -one against legendary units that, or, or three-star units, that's a good day. All of my green units without any unit perks uh, all have Lorenzes. It's a great weapon. Yeah, I've really changed how I think about um, weapons. I sold a bunch of Lorenzes and Tylers in the beginning of the campaign. Next campaign, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep them, give them to my less experienced units. They're great weapons in the hands of less experienced units. Um, yeah, you just saw another one of his units shatter. Okay, I need to prepare for... One of his oversized units attacking my 1855s, one-star unit. So yeah, I had a little bit of bouncing around of units, um, but that's okay. I mean, we got that. We have that under control. And yeah, wherever possible, three of my units firing into one of his with artillery and support is a great thing. He's attacking, yeah, one of his units just shattered. His little unit of, uh, that came in at 600 went down to 5-something and shattered. His unit that came in, what was that, 2,500 is going back at 2,000. Yeah, his units are just getting torn up. Oh, that was a unit of 700, just shattered. His unit of 1,600 is moving so slow. So, yeah, I have taken the woods. Um, my units have visibility. They don't see anything, so the enemy is not in that immediate vicinity. So what I want to do is get the infantry up. I'm now moving all the infantry on my left forward into the woods. That's a good defensive position. Detach. I'm going to detach skirmishers. Uh, send the cav to the south. Um, send the sniper units also to the south and see what we can see and start picking off his enemy units in the rear. Yeah, I have my... You'll notice I have my infantry. I back them up a little bit. I don't want him to stand in the woods like he is now. I want him to advance where he has no cover. 
he might have a little cover where he's standing right now, so I have my infantry unit back up and hopefully draw him into the open where 24-pound howitzers and 20-pound parrots firing exploding shell will just wreak havoc on him. And my entire right still hasn't moved. I'm hoping he attacks and tries to take that supply point, uh, but apparently that's not enough bait. So I'm trying to bait him forward. I should really uh, send attached skirmishers forward and try to bait him into an attack. But uh, everything is going so well. Oh, he's down to almost 20,000. So, yeah, I look at that and I'm, yeah, he's, he's toast. Yeah, two more units just shattered. I finally have my uh, cav and snipers ready to go. They're all rested. So he's down to 20,000. Let's go ahead and get these guys moving. Bring the infantry up in support. Have my detached skirmishers advance, and uh, we'll see what's in the next clump of woods and also get south of it, so anything in there we can uh, fight. Yeah, he attacked. Look at that little unit of 600. He's going to die. Yep, and gone. Okay, he has a full-size infantry unit uh, that was in reserve. Probably defending the, um, the artillery that we all know is over there. So I have units come in to the north and have my infantry fall back to the wood line there in the open. I can get my snipers south of him and get shots on him. I'd like to lure him into the open. That would be great. Actually, I'm looking at a 24-pound uh, howitzer that um, would be doing much better if I were to move him in support of those infantry units. Yeah, the 20-pound parrot that's there and the 24-pound howitzer. Get him moving at least in the right direction. Yeah, I'm just, there's plenty of time. It's only 7.30. The, the battle's been going on just over an hour, and his army's being just, just totally wiped out. Um, the more he steps up and takes canister, canister to the face, I mean, this these are easy, easy kills. Now I see a couple of his batteries. Uh, my cab is to the south. We have visibility. I'm going to move my long-range guns to get shots on his artillery, and now we're just going to pick him apart. The snipers are going to do a good job. Okay, we're going to take the next clump of trees. His infantry is down to 1,500. Yeah, his army in the south is just in an absolutely terrible position. I don't want to do anything to to disrupt that. Um, if I attack with my main army, I might drive him south. I don't want to drive him south. So what I want to do is just let him stand there in the open like he's doing, taking canister and exploding shell, and let these guys, let my units that are on my far left flank sweep him out of this area and come up behind that infantry if at all possible. So big sweeping motion, destroy all this artillery, and he's going to be defenseless. But um, I need to, while this is, uh, you know, taking all of my attention, now that my reinforcements are coming in, which is what I really wanted to wait for, um, my reinforcements are coming in. I have a huge army now on the right that is not doing anything. It's time to unload those. But keep in mind, um, we have a ton of time. Those guys are going to walk along the right edge of the map, the north edge of the map, and um, all the way uh, in a big sweeping motion, all the way around the enemy flank, all the way to the south edge of the map. It's a very long walk. There's no reason to be in a hurry. Unlike day two, we have tons of time um, using infantry and detached skirmishers and artillery all working together. It's just a long, slow walk that the enemy can't do anything about. And we're going to get them all. 
I mean, and very, very quickly, I figured out that because of what happened on day two, this is completely one-sided. So, and it is. So I need to move 24 pound howitzers up. Uh, now we're in the phase of the battle in the center and south that uh, we're just gonna roll these guys up. So the 24 pound howitzers need to be pushed forward because this is all gonna go one way. Uh, there's no threat of a uh, large number of enemy counterattacks, but he surprises me. I move the Iron Brigade forward and he immediately counterattacked. Now I expected him to attack here a long time ago. But by attacking here, what he does is he completely exposes his flank. So my units that are attacking into the woods to the north are going to come in behind these guys. And, yeah, these guys, I wanted him to attack out of the woods. But it really doesn't matter. He takes some shots of infantry and artillery and just crumples. So, yeah, every place I can see his artillery, I'm actually... Aiming my long-range guns, my 20-pound parrots and Whitworths can reach him. And, yeah, so we're, we're tearing his artillery apart. Um, his artillery in the south is down to 200 men per unit, and they're flashing white. Um, we're rolling him up. And although he had that short, brief attack north of the objective... Uh, I'm not seeing a whole bunch over there right now. It looks pretty empty. What I expect to see now is individual units, like this unit of 800, is going to charge forward to their death. And, um, yeah, if they charge one at a time, I can gang up on them with fire and shatter them pretty easily. And that seems to be what's happening. We're in that phase where he's attacking one unit at a time. And we, yeah, we just, his units are just evaporating. And the other thing, too, even though this is on legendary, and all his units are three stars. Oh, his general just died. Yeah, great. Um, even though this is on legendary, all of his units are three stars. It doesn't matter. Um, I can take any, right now, any two one-star units that have good condition, especially if the commander is nearby, at fire into the enemy, and then, you know, they've all been degraded now, uh, the enemy units. Uh, any place I want to, two units can charge into one if he doesn't have any support or any um, non-routed units around him if he's isolated. He's going to rout. So he can't defend. He can't stand and defend. If it comes to it, uh, I can charge into melee and and rout him. Um, his commanders are being killed. His ability to recover is being degraded. That means that even when he does recover, um, he'll be slow, won't be able to fight. He'll be easily routed again. Yeah, we're in that part of the battle. So, yep, and my long-range guns finally took out his artillery in the north. I hope you watched him die. That was great. And we can finish the battle now. But of course we don't want to. Um, this is... Yeah, this is like shooting fish in a barrel now. Now it's just a matter of uh, managing condition. I saw a unit flash exhausted. Just need to make um, rest. Tired units push units that have 50% or more condition forward. Keep firing at the enemy, keep degrading, degrading them, kill commanders when you see them. Keep pushing the artillery up. Uh, I've gotten really, really into the habit of making sure that my um, short-range smoothbore cannon stays in canister range of my infantry, so I don't let my infantry get out of range of artillery support, that my artillery and my infantry move together, and... Yeah, uh, if you do that, the enemy doesn't have a chance. Because he can't do that. He can't move as a combined arms team, and my units can. So I'm not just pushing up three infantry units to get three on one. I'm pushing up three infantry units and three 24-pound howitzers to get six on one. And that's only going to go one way. So I just found another one of his... Yeah, he routes instantly, takes a whole bunch of losses. 
I'm taking, yeah, this is the micromanagement of long range guns. I see an artillery unit, all my long range guns uh, target him. And yeah, that, that gives you an idea of how many long range batteries I have. And that's not all of them. Um, I think the 20 pound parrots aren't even on the map right now. That's six, or the 10 pound parrots. Uh, that's six more batteries of 12 guns each that isn't even here. Yeah, I don't think they're here. That would be... Yeah. So notice third core. You only get four units of third core in this phase of the battle. So the chance for third core to get XP is almost entirely on day two. And that's one of the reasons I fought day two the way I did. Those units got a lot of XP. You're going to see when we go to camp that, uh, you know, a whole bunch of guys got promotions and yeah, the officers all got promoted. And, yeah, it was really good for the army. Okay, I'm actually moving my cav to a new position. They did their job on the uh, Union left and came in behind the enemy line and gave me a lot of spotting, but there's not much more for them to do over on the Union left. They did their job there, so now I'm moving them around to actually the Union right, and that's the beauty of having cav instead of uh, sniper units. Sniper units have a tough time doing that. Uh, moving across the battlefield to do something somewhere else. So really like the flexibility of these cav units. So I'm having them move all the way to the Union right, where they're going to be a whole lot more useful than where they are. And um, yeah, they're going to get there and they're going to be very useful. So I have really, really developed a love of rifled cav. Wow, I just saw an infantry unit that's got uh, like 10 to 1 uh, kill ratio. There's another infantry unit, 55's got 1,000 kills, another guy is uh, 1,100. My units are getting really good kills. There's an infantry unit, I just saw one that didn't do very well. So, wow, was that CS Richmond? That's a nice kill ratio. Um, yeah, CS Richmond's doing having a good day. Another unit shatters. Yeah, I want my snipers to the south. There's plenty for them to do, firing into the flank of the enemy. Uh, I, I edit out uh, the parts where I hit pause and give a whole bunch of orders. Having this much artillery requires a lot of orders given to artillery. So, you know, you have to you have to move the 24-pound howitzers and 10-pound ord forward forward all the time. They have to be right on the uh, right on the line. They they have to be moved forward. The 20-pound parrots and Whitworths and six rifle a little bit further back. That when the enemy's retreating the entire length of the map, they have to be moved. Snipers, I'm doing it right now. I'm micromanaging the snipers to shoot at the artillery. When the long-range guns get into position, I'm going to have to order them to... Well, I don't know how much our artillery is. There's not a whole bunch of artillery left. But I'm going to want them to shoot at um, enemy artillery if I happen to see any. And then after that, I'll use them as... Um, I'll push them as far forward as I possibly can just to get kills. So I drive up their XP. So... Yeah, that's, um, yeah, here's one unit kind of blocking my army, and I told all those guys to charge, and they're not doing it, so they must not be enthusiastic about a charge. So really, before I hit charge over there, I should have moved the commander right there, so they'd have been in the, uh, within range of the commander, um, because if they don't want to charge, they're not going to do it, but if the commander's there, there's a greater chance they will. 
But yeah, I have one isolated enemy unit of 1,300, and I have one, two, three, four, four infantry, a detached skirmisher, and now two cav. So there's no way that guy should just not be, like, run over, and I seize the woods. And once I seize the woods, everybody can just sit for 20 minutes in game and um, in good cover, recover their condition, and it's all good. That what I don't want is him in cover firing into my units in the open. So, yeah, I think they didn't charge because my commander was, uh, if he'd been closer, they would have charged. And that would have been actually a better result. Wow, 400 kills to 30 losses. Some of these units are having just a fine day. 1,600, is that 1,100 kills? The 10 Ord, uh, some of them are getting good numbers. There's a unit, 1,300 kills, 1,100 kills, no losses, 1,200 kills, no losses. 20-pound parrot, 800 kills, very few losses. Uh, you'll notice my supply wagons, um, I have them to the rear and turned off. I am paying attention to supply. I have so many units with plenty of supply that there's no reason to actually spend any. Um, yeah, I am looking at the supply bar, and these units have plenty of supply. There's, uh, if somebody runs out of ammo, he can just get replaced by two other units that have plenty of ammo. Uh, this is coming to the end, obviously. And it's only, it's not even 10 a.m. Yeah, you, you might be saying, uh, why aren't, am I not pushing the infantry forward? I'm letting the infantry recover condition, um, and I just got the artillery moved up. And it, it seems like I just got the artillery moved up, and they're already too far away. So I'm going to take all the way down to the observation post, and my artillery is, you know, that's too far. My artillery is too far away from the observation post. So, yeah, I'm checking the condition of these units. Some of them are 100%, so I let the guys... You know, notice I let the guys rest, and they're, you know, I have 90 condition. So, JF Browns are out of ammo. What I decided to do with him, which you'll see in a moment, is I just have him march to the other end of the map and build up condition. Uh, that's, you know, he can fire at one-third speed for free, or I can just send him on a very long walk, and he'll build condition, which is very useful for these snipers. Because if they have to run away... Uh, and they don't have condition, they, they die. And, um, yeah, building up condition for your snipers is a very, very good thing to think about. So they are in a perfect position just to rack up a bunch of free kills. I, I prefer to get, um, I prefer to give one-star sniper units the sharps. They do better. Uh, with the Sharps and with the JF Browns, and it's kind of, you don't want to give units that um, aren't very good the best weapons. That's kind of wasteful. They'll just take losses and you'll lose good weapons. Um, so on both accounts, they get more kills and they build up more XP if you give them Sharps. Once they have, a unit has the second star though, definitely want to give them JF Browns. So... Yeah, I tell this guy, he could take a long walk, man. Just build up condition. My sharps unit is has some ammo, and he still has 30 condition, so he can get a few more shots. So these guys to the north, um, no reason to really worry very much about that guy in the woods. I'm going to stack up a bunch of infantry in a second. Stack the 10-pound... Uh, the artillery, I have three artillery over there. Um, we don't have to rush. He's not going anywhere. So, 
I'm going to surround him and then overwhelm him with numbers. And if he stands, which he shouldn't be able to stand, but if he does, uh, I'll charge him with five or six units, and now I have my commander over there, but he gives it up right away. Now it looks like I'm going to catch him in the water. That's going to be, that's going to be good. So yeah, move the artillery up, move the infantry up. I just let uh, everybody rest and let the artillery get some free kills, some free XP. Uh, just having my artillery move now will get them some condition. So that's what I'm thinking about right now. Anybody who can't can't fight needs to go on a march and get some condition. I know almost, um, yeah, if anybody's listening, there will only be a few people listening to this at this point, but um, if you are and you're really into playing Ultimate General Civil War, especially on Legendary, I, I recommend, of course, watching Pandacrout. You learn so much about the mechanics of the game, but also Atheist and Ray Rivers on Legendary and then everybody else who's done really great playthroughs on uh, Major General, like Fiasco and, and Spectrum and you know all the other good playthroughs out there. Um, but, but, um, uh, I think the history guy, um, he's called the history guy. He's doing a playthrough on legendary union, but pay attention. I think it's interesting. The numbers, um, in my game, the enemy came in with 85,000, um, on, um, uh, atheist, uh, 81,000. He came in with 81,000, but atheist only brought 62,000 men to this battle. Uh, the enemy had a higher manpower pool, so uh, I came in with 79,000, so I came in with more men, but we faced about the same size enemy army. Ray Rivers only faced 62,000 men in this battle, so and he brought in 85,000, over 85,000 men in his army. So you can have very, very different uh, unit sizes and enemy armies that you face and I recommend, you know, just getting a feel for what other people face is really uh, interesting and gives you an idea of what you're going to face in your battle. Um, if you are as aggressive as Ray Rivers, you know, by the time you get here, you're going to drive down the manpower pool so much that the enemy army is going to be small. Now, I think in also both of their campaigns, the enemy had about 50 to 60 training, and I'm facing 73. So, yep, we captured the last of the enemy. He's gone. He comes in with, what is it, 3,400 on the last day. Uh, complete slaughter. Um, we get uh, some units from each core. So third core does get to bring in some units. I reorganized them a little bit. Uh, third core does get to come in, but it doesn't really count because it's completely useless because there's nothing to fight. I mean, this is over in, you know, no time. Did I have no officers lost in day two? It was such a crushing victory. I had I lost no officers. So I'm moving around. Um, you don't really have to because you can choose any units. I'm just moving officers around, pushing higher numbers forward and pushing lower numbers um, to the rear so that when I go into the next phase, I don't have to think very much about what I'm doing and I can keep divisions together. So... Yeah, and I've, I've moved really damaged units to 5th Corps, so the total number of men in my army is not 62,000. I've actually moved men out of the army into 5th Corps. So, yeah. There we are, and yeah, there are all the 10-pound parrots. The 10-pound parrots had to get some kills. They had to kill something. Um, yeah, I have a whole row of 10-pound parrots, a whole division of them. Hoping they get some kills. The six-pound rifles uh, that are up there, I think, do get some kills. The ten-pound parrots 
completely underwhelming. So I'm hoping to get them some XP. I was hoping to get the officers some promotions. I don't think any of that happened. I think uh, all I did was drive up scaling and accomplish nothing with those guys. So they were useless here. Hopefully I get them some XP at Gettysburg so that, you know, I'd, I'd like for them to have a star so when I go to Muleshoe, um, you know, we just have an overwhelming long-range counter-battery army. And um, he's going to have, he had 200, over 200 guns on Major General. Who knows what he'll have, you know, on Legendary. But I intend to hit him with some really deadly long-range artillery. So, he, he has some good cav over here. It dies. So, yeah, I stacked up the right with a bunch of good units and lots of support and artillery because that's where his best units are. And over here I'm hoping to... Having a terrible time keeping his um, his skirmisher units in... You know, as long as they're visible, I can hit them with something. So... Yeah, a little tiny red bar left. Just... Yeah, just kill them. Oh, he's going to get into melee. And he dies. So, yep, that's how you do that. Lots of supporting fire. And, yeah, his cav is deadly but fragile. Just like yours. So I know he has another cav on the right side. Is all his cav over here dead? I don't think so. I'm, I'm still moving my... Yep, he, he has another unit still alive. Yeah, I, I've really gotten used to the fact that you cannot charge these dismounted or his uh, skirmisher units until you're right on top of them. So I have to get my cav out of there, let them um, re-energize their charge command uh, because you have to wait some period of time until that recharges. And uh, yeah, I don't want to get in the melee. Now his, um, his cav unit is not going to go out of visibility, so I'm just going to go ahead and charge him with my melee cav. And now my rifled cav come in and put some shots on him, and he's overwhelmed. So he's gone. Captured. So now all that should be there is just a couple of crappy sniper units. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating because I'm not getting cav bo the charge bonus because the units need to recharge. So... It's kind of like here where I got, you know, don't get in melee unless you can get the charge bonus on these guys and these detached skirmish or these sniper units are tough because they go out of visibility and then even though you hit charge, your units will stop charging and then have to, you know, uh, take a break for some number of minutes. So... Yeah, and off screen, he his cav walked forward and died. So yeah, uh, turned out great. Um, got a very nice kill ratio, thirty two hundred kills for that infantry unit, twenty seven twenty three. So my infantry uh, led in the killing parade. My twenty four pound howitzers and twenty pound parrots got fifteen hundred. A lot of this is uh, who got to fight in what phases. Um, my iron brigade got ten to one. Uh, nice, nice Iron Brigade. Uh, 1,000 kills for the 20-pound parrots and no losses. Yeah, this is all great. According to the results, I lost a gun, but I got it back with medicine, so I lost no guns, even though I didn't replace any men, and that's what I wanted. Um, I didn't replace any of the men in between battles. And, um, yeah, JF Browns killed 500, and they 
weren't that active. The Mainers got a nice uh, kills. The Burnsides did fairly well. Uh, the 10 pound, you know, you count on the 10 pounders um, to get a fairly good number of kills five, six, eight hundred. The six rifle did great. Um, they are just such an efficient gun and they're like $800 a piece. They're just really, really good. Green units all did well. Um, I think all of them got a star. I uh, had a whole bunch of units that did not fight in this battle, including a, a unit of JF Browns that did not fight in the battle at all. A whole bunch of units did not even show up. Um, and a ton of promotions. On Legendary, when you get almost 70,000 kills in a battle, expect to get a lot of promotions. Another, th I've never had this many three-star uh, generals. I'll take the Tylers. I was complaining about them earlier. They're fine. The enemy had 24-pound howitzers and 10-pound parrots. Yeah, looks great. Um, he did not give me any infields. That's also a good unit. Um, yeah, it's all great. And we go to the follow-on battle, and I'll see you there. I hope you enjoyed this. This was incredibly fun to fight. Love this battle, and I'll see you in the next one.